Hey, it's Alex Williams of the New Stack here with my good friend, Michael Cote. Michael, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm calling in live from my home office. Yes, you are. And I'm from my home office with the window that has a bird on it because we're- That's right. Yeah, no more bird lives will be lost. That's right. And today, Michael, you're here with us and we're going to be talking about uh, this idea of cloud native, right? In like cloud native architectures. And so you guys have put together some pretty substantive concepts around, you know, what cloud native architectures really mean. And so I know I thought what we could do here is you could give a, a presentation, I think brief about what this concept's about. And then in our, in, a, in the blog post that comes with this will be a more detailed look at what cloud native architectures are and what they are, you know, how they're being applied and so on and so forth. Sure. Yeah, that sounds good. I mean, I mean, I think to your point, uh, you know, all, all, all of us at Pivotal, like, uh, follow the stuff in, uh, in the new stack and other places. And, and I, think, uh, I, I, think, I think what you've been helping us put together and what you'll link to in, in the associated thing is sort of like, here's, here's Pivotal's take on, like, what, uh, what we kind of think the new stack, so to speak, is. Like, the stack that we're seeing out there and that our customers are using. And, um, you know, I, I started in Pivotal uh, back in January of this year. It's, it's going to be that time where uh, people log into LinkedIn and they're like, congratulate Michael on being a year, which will, that's always an awkward uh, moment there. Maybe I can turn that off. I, I, I need less attention. Uh, anyways, um, but I, I think since, since we've been here, like um, uh, definitely um, my, my boss, Andrew Schaefer, he's, he's been working on a way of conceptualizing this stack that we have. And I, and I think I think he and, and the rest of the folks at Pivotal have come up with a pretty good way of discussing uh, the kind of what the cloud native stack is and, and what to look for in it. And you know, obviously, that um, the concept of what we we consider the the cloud native stack is perfectly favors our product. I mean, you know, that you should expect that. Uh, but I, I think it's actually a pretty good generalized approach to having like a layered approach to all of the concerns you would have if you were running a, a cloud native stack. And so, uh, you know, like you're saying, we, we've actually, we're actually doing the fun thing where we're recording the introduction at the end of doing most of the other content. But, but you, you've, you've talked with several of my teammates, you know, uh, people like Josh Long and Casey West, and, and also I think uh, with, with Bridget, uh, about, um, you know, some of the more technical aspects of what's in this stack. And so hopefully what we can put together here is, is a good overview of like, if you want to do things in kind of the pivotal way, in the cloud native way, here's, here's what we're seeing work and what our customers are seeing work. Great. Yeah. So what we're thinking about is, is, you know, this four part video series. And then that, then there's also some blog posts that will accompany that. Yeah. So I think it's a good package to get that understanding, you know, kind of the how to technical aspects of what these cloud native architectures are from the pivotal point of view. Yeah, and and to your point, you know, like anyone who uh, uh, anyone who wants to get more detail and and hear more of my uh, my thrilling voice, there's there's more content that you probably than you probably have time in your life to consume out there. Uh, but I I want to I want to zoom in to just if if the audience can put up with one slide, just one yes. slide. I got to have a slide. I was an industry analyst for many years, and I have to have slides. Slide. We, we got lots of command lines and blinking cursors in the other videos, but this is the one where we're going to have a slide. It's like a Monty Python. Or something just yeah yeah this is where we have the rotating knives and the conveyor belt <laughs> everything's gonna pan out so what you see here is and this is again this is a, a great concept that uh, that Andrew's been leading the way of thinking about this and I think it's I think it's a nice way of thinking about it um, in the sense that so so the cloud native platform that we that we offer is Pivotal Cloud Foundry, based on the open source uh, Cloud Foundry stuff. If if you haven't heard about it, it, it was started about six years ago, like back at VMware, and um, they got a, a a team of people who were uh, from Google and other places, and they wanted to build the a very they didn't use this phrase back then, but a stack of software that would that cloud natives would consider the way that you do software and. You know, six years ago is, is a long time ago in, in, in this neck of the woods. Uh, but but it's, it's evolved over time. And uh, we've, we've had, we have a public version of it. And we also have uh, an on-premises version, metaphorically and literally speaking. But that seems to be what most of our customers like to buy. But anyways, when you think about if you want to run in a cloud-native way, I've, I've been finding that separating it out into these four layers and then having a series of promises and contracts, as I'll discuss, is, is a handy way of 
making sure you get as as the slide says a platform that can keep promises or or as i would jokingly put it that works <laughs> and that has ha, fully encompasses everything that you would want to do so let, let me just start at the bottom here um so at the bottom, like the thing that enables all of this, like if I was giving the bigger version of this presentation, you'd see sort of like how cloud makes operations more efficient. But the thing that enables everything to be possible here, in large part, is how automated and efficient cloud infrastructure is nowadays, just infrastructure as a service. Um, so, you know, it's just a better way to run your infrastructure than manually uh, configuring and provisioning things or even doing it in kind of like the mid uh, mid 2000s more automated way of doing stuff but what, what the way that we work is we're basically a cloud platform layer so a layer that sits on top of whatever infrastructure you bring to the table and you can see the uh, the uh, the logos of types of infrastructure we support there I always like to say that we support all the great clouds to make a good uh, reference for for a certain types of podcast listeners um, and, and so we support running on AWS, on, on VMware, on vCloud Air or vSphere or whatever. You can run on Microsoft Azure's cloud and you can run on OpenStack. And, and I forget the exact breakout that our customers have, but there's a, interestingly, uh, people are always interested in OpenStack. We have an interesting, I think it's a minority, but I think it's a pretty sizable minority of people who run on OpenStack um, on premise. Um, cool. Most people run on VMware and we run our public instance pivotal web services on AWS and we're getting um, a lot of interest uh, in people running on top of Azure, especially now that we support .NET. I should put that logo here in the slide. But now that we support .NET, uh, people want to run on Azure as well. But the point is, um, you can go look this up in a longer presentation, but the first idea of a contract that's provided, and you can think of a contract as like a spec or something, is we have something called a cloud provider interface. And I don't have a visual of it here, but there's basically like 18 or so methods and there are things for like, you know, uh, provision a server, install this, uh, this, this VM on a server. Is the server up and running? Reboot the server. Like the kind of core stuff you would do with, with a server, literally and figuratively speaking. And you implement that CPI, and that makes it so that you can run on top of whatever infrastructure you have. So there's this promise that's being made in the stack that if you implement uh, the CPI, I promise that I can keep your workloads up and running and I can automate it in a very cloud friendly way. And the contract is that API that you do. And this pattern repeats itself as you go up, up the stack. So above the infrastructure, the thing that's, that's dealing with the CPI is this layer we have Bosch. We haven't come up with a fantastic logo for it yet. So we have that, uh, that funny little clam guy. This is, this is uh, as we always like to joke, it's a good example of, of you really shouldn't let developers name things because they come up with wacky stuff, as, as, as you, Alex, know painfully now in, in your coverage. Um, but what happens in the Bosch layer is this is the layer that takes and uses that CPI, and it goes and, and layers everything above it on top of all the infrastructure. And it does all of the things like uh, if you need to provision a, a database or you need to provision a new, a new set of uh, a new VM that's running a bunch of containers in it, you also need to make sure that you have uh, high availability if you want to upgrade things and patch it. It does all of that automation of your infrastructure layer underneath it. So you can think of it as, as the, uh, the provisioner, installer, the configure, but also the thing that's checking health and assuring uptime. So um, it's baked in configuration in some respects, but more. Than that's right. That's right. And, and so this layer is, um, it's, it's a lot of what um, oh, over the past five, 10 years or so, like people have been concerned with when you're just getting your software installed on your, your virtualized and cloud infrastructure and making sure that it's up and running. So similarly, right, like if you look up the stack towards the, the runtime layer, the, 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 the promise and contract mix that Bosch is doing is it says, if you package things up and describe it to me, to Bosch, in a way that, uh, that I can manage and deploy it, then you don't have to worry about that and I'll automate all of this stuff for you because I, I have this, this contract and the set of promises with the infrastructure layer and I can handle that for you. And then you at the upper part of the stack, you don't have to worry about um, you know, provisioning and configuring and things like that. So up at the runtime layer and you know, conceptually you can think of this as the Pivotal Cloud Foundry layer. I mean, Pivotal Cloud Foundry is actually all of this stuff, not the infrastructure part, but at the runtime layer is where you have, as we call this component, the elastic runtime. And what happens here, this is where uh, all of the, so whenever you deploy an application into Pivotal Cloud Foundry, 
it, uh, it creates containerized versions of your application for you, the various nodes and parts of it. And at this runtime layer is where it orchestrates and does the scheduling, as people call it nowadays. It, it play, it's the, the stuff that your application runs in. And it makes sure that everything's wired up. And, and to some extent, you know, it gets a little fuzzy. This is why this is more of a logical, conceptual thing. But, you know, that handles your, 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 um, your routing of where domain names go and things like that. Like, it, it does a lot of, this is really like what a lot of people think of, of what a pass, a platform as a service does. And, and, and again, it also orchestrates all the containers for you. And this layer is also interesting because if you look at most, uh, at least at least when I look at most of the discussion about uh, containers and Docker and things like that, a lot of what people talk about nowadays is at this runtime layer, right? Like, where do I place my containers and how do I get them up and running and bring them down and bring them up and scale them and do all of that? And so this orchestration layer is, is, is part of, of let's four layer cake that you have in order to achieve a full cloud native stack. Um, and, you know, I think this is, to, to be fair, it's where a lot of, from an application developer's perspective, a lot of the magic happens here. Uh, and, and so it is, is a, a, a nice layer. Now, the layer above that. So, so far, everything I've described. Every, every cake needs a little magic. Exactly. You need, you need, you need I always thought those, uh, you would have like those, those chrome colored, uh, like little balls and sprinklers sprinkles you would put on cake uh -huh. and it always bugged me out that you could eat them because i would think they were like pieces of metal and so it seemed like some magic that you could eat dbs uh mm -hmm. you know who knows how they did that maybe i ate too many of those and it, oh, it's so the magic better. is in Boston. exactly and and so all of these layers that i've described thus far they get you what i call the blinking cursor right so you get all this up and running and then you open and then and you sit open up your computer and you've got this blinking cursor and it's ready for you to write software and deploy an application and you know now the real work of actually doing something interesting uh, happens so that's where the application framework layer comes in and in that layer is basically all of the programming languages that you want and you know I, I've got a very crowded uh, list of all the things we support I like I mentioned earlier we also have .NET now we just added that about a month ago and, and, you know, the stuff that comes with that. So you have all of the, not only can you sort of like uh, program in these languages, but the way that they execute and all the supporting libraries and stuff is, is built in and integrated to the platform, right? Because there's this, again, a series of promises and contracts that are being made that if I write in a 12-factor style and I use a microservices approach, then everything below it can support this application and run it, right? Like I don't need to figure out I just follow the, the contract and then, and then the promises can be kept, kept below me. And I don't have to think about how I, I scale this out or like I, I do all sorts of things like that. All, all of those concepts are kind of built into the, to the, to the platform approach here, the principles. And, and when, when, you, when you see the demos of how like uh, the loop of using like Spring Boot and Spring Cloud, you'll kind of see this idea of contracts and promises play out where like this is the style of development that you do and the constraints that you have for this development, but then it gives you all this freedom because all these other things are taken care of for you. Like when you go through the boot and configuration thing, you see how configuration is auto-wired in and inserted in depending on what your runtime environment is and things like that. So also at this, I, I like to think that also at this application layer, you have a lot of the middleware things that you need like databases and queues and mobile backends that again, are built into the system and they, they are satisfying the contracts of how they would run in a cloud native platform. Therefore, they can be managed by the platform. And therefore, you as a developer, someone writing applications on it, you don't really have to worry about how they're deployed and how they're used. And here, I think an analogy to, um, I mean, basically a competitor is, is good to kind of understand that, right? Like when you go out and use AWS or you use a public cloud, you as a developer aren't always really concerned with how that stuff is running, right? So you look at something like AWS Lambda and you don't really ask like what operating system it's running in or how those servers are provisioned or how the networking is done. Like to you, you're at this very high level of it where all you care about is writing the application and deploying it into this, this stack that you have and it executes. And that same notion of when you have this full stack, you don't really need to worry about managing everything underneath it if you don't want to applies here. And that's, that's kind of what you see on the cultural side, right? Is like the roles, they can more focus on, on what they're good at and, and what, what the business side finds valuable as they move up the stack, right? So, you know, as, as, I, uh, as, as I like to joke, like whenever, 
whenever the the CIO is sitting in his uh, his or her sort of annual performance review, like the CEO is not like, good job provisioning servers this year, gold star. Yeah. Right? You know, it's not really a big business value that you've provisioned servers or, you know, made sure that things are automated. What people really focus on, and that's why there's more people as you go up the stack, is really what's up, up there, up close up there, is the actual uh, applications that you're developing. And so instead of, like, spending a lot of your time, uh, no matter where you are in the stack, having to be aware of and develop and, and wire together everything, that's really, like, how I've seen the idea of platform as a service evolve into more and more of what, what we like to call, like, a cloud platform or a cloud native framework, is that you have this fully integrated stack of concepts that really fit together, and there's an actual, like, technologies behind them, not just slideware. And then that allows you instead to focus on... Um, basically developing software more rapidly <laughs> to, to really break it down, right? Like that's the end effect that you get is, is you have more speed when it comes to um, uh, writing your software and then you can just focus on uh, applications essentially. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's a, that's a pretty uh, quick run. There, there's, there, I have, I have another uh, version of this that we can put a link to. I, I gave a kind of an overview of a fuller version of this at a, a recent Gartner conference where we discussed this. But this is, this is how we're starting to kind of think about and explain what it is that uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry uh, delivers to people. Uh, and, yeah. and in future episodes, we'll get into more details. So I know we're looking at Spring Boot uh, and Initializer. We're also looking at uh, Spring Cloud and then also a, a discussion about uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry. And so we'll have several more uh, discussions that go into more technical details. So thank you, Michael, for taking the time uh, to talk about the, the, you know, giving this overview. And sure. you know, yeah, now now all listeners need is like to fill in all the uh, the technical gaps of my Swiss cheese overview, <laughs> and then and then you'll get like a solid piece of cheese. Thanks. To uh, You'll get the Swiss cheese, and then it'll melt into this beautiful, you know, sandwich of sorts—a four-layer sandwich. Exactly. Excellent. Well, Michael, thank you for taking the time uh, to talk today and giving this overview. And we look forward to uh, presenting the fuller uh, perspective from Pivotal on this whole idea of cloud-native architectures. Sounds great. Great. Thanks.